and uh, I, had a, I had a pistol there under, under my pillow and I managed to get the pistol out, carefully unzipped the door of the tent and looked out and there was a bear about a, with his snout about a foot away from me. Welcome to Pull the Podcasts, where you'll hear stories from geologists who've spent their careers, their lives, exploring and studying the remarkable and remote geology of Greenland. Why did they become fascinated with Greenland? What were the problems and the discoveries that drove them? And what was it like working in these remote places where few people venture, even now? I'm Julie Holtz. In this episode, we hear more from Kent Brooks, Emeritus Professor at the Geological Museum in Copenhagen, about his encounters with polar bears while on geological fieldwork in East Greenland. When we're working for the uh the second year was in Nordic, Nordic Mining Company. The, um, we worked, worked along the Blossfield coast and we were right at Rubiaxfjord. And uh, we were in the tent there one night. We had, to, we had two, two pyramid tents, Fjallraven pyramid tents. And uh, we had them pitched on the beach. And uh, at some point during the night, in the early morning, I think, about four o'clock in the morning, I suddenly felt, uh, felt a big weight on my feet. I thought, what the hell's going on here? Is that... That Daddy Thomas and his tried playing some sort of trick on me. And I pulled up my feet from underneath the, the weight, and uh, I immediately became clear that it wasn't wasn't any trick that Bjorn was playing. That it, there was a, an incredible animal-like smell in the air, and uh, and I think the sash sa- sashing around, and a big blow came on the side of the tent and hit me on the back, and. Uh, I had, a, I had a pistol there under, under my pillow, and I managed to get the pistol out and went. I was lying on my stomach and carefully unzipped the door of the tent and looked out, and there was a bear about a, with his snout about a foot away from me. And uh, I had the pistol pointed right at him, and I thought, shall I shoot it, uh, or will he be able to tear me to pieces before he actually dies, even if I shoot him through the, through the skull? And I thought it was probably not a good idea to shoot at such close range. <laughs> and uh, after a short period, the bear lost interest in me and started ambling away. And uh, and I started screaming, Bjorn, Bjorn! Which means bear in Danish. And uh, Bjorn Thomas was of the opinion I was calling to him. And it, I heard this sleepy voice coming out of the tent saying, It's not time to get up yet, it's only four o'clock in the morning. And I said, No, 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 no. no. Which means polar bear in Greenlandic. And then he came out of the tent, and by this time, the bear was about uh, 50 yards away, I guess, ambling away. And I'd actually shot, shot into the ground close to it to, to get it to move faster and get away faster. But the trouble was that it was rather fascinated by where the bullet hit the ground and turned round to examine what was going on and showed every sign of coming back again to find out where, what the strange noise was. So that probably wasn't a very good idea to do that. Anyhow, Bjorn came, came out of his tent in his underpants with his camera in his hand and he said, What do you let it get away for before I got a picture of it? Anyhow, it went round, a, went round some rocks and Bjorn and I went up there and Bjorn thought he might get a picture of the top of the rocks. But the bloody thing was about a mile away. I, how it had got so far in that time, I had no idea. They must move really fast. I mean, it was it was a tiny white speck in the far distance, and all this in in, in a matter of a couple of minutes or so. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, that was the that was the bear in uh, Rubiaxfjord. We also had had one when we camped on Kramer's Island with uh, trolls and me and a bloke called Talia Holland who subsequently became the Danish chief of, uh, of um, uh, Greenpeace. And Trolls, Trolls said in the morning, he said there'd been a bear through the camp in the night. And we laughed at him and said, uh, you imagine all kinds of things when you're half asleep, don't you? And, uh, yeah, sure. That, but then, uh, then shortly afterwards, we found, we found tracks of a bear going right between the tents. <laughs> so it was probably quite right what Trolls said. But the best one was uh, when I was with this chap called, uh, um, uh, what's his name, Phil Neuhoff, and we were camped on the uh, the Prince of Wales Mountains. And you now the Prince of Wales Mountains are, uh, what are they, 20, 20, 20 kilometres North of the end of Kangatluxrak Fjord, there are uh, noon attacks in the inland ice. And when we were going there, we thought there was very little chance we'd have uh, any wildlife on them. 
and so uh, we decided we weren't going to take any artillery. Now Phil Doyhoff is a is is a is from 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 the American West, and he has no fear of uh, of uh, guns, and he generally goes around with a whole load of artillery on him. Well, he didn't take anything on this particular occasion, and as just as the helicopter was about to take off. I remembered something I had to get, to get from the tent, and I ran back to the tent to get this thing. And I I saw saw my, my pistol lying on the on my uh, in, in in on the on the floor of the tent. I thought, well, I, I might as well take the pistol anyhow. So I shoved it into my pocket, and I it, I didn't have any ammunition. I think I had four rounds of ammunition in it. I didn't think it was very important to have. Anyhow, I went up to this place, and we're sitting there uh, eating our dinner one night. And the peculiar thing is the Arctic Institute used to give out this booklet telling you how to deal with polar bears in Greenland. And one of the things it told you was it was absolutely imperative if you camped out in the wild in Greenland where the, where there might be bears that you could have a have a, a, a line around the tent around the camp which would set off an alarm if a, if a bear crossed it into the camp. Well, we've never had anything like that. But it told you that uh, one of the best things to... Uh, to uh, bait, bait the line with was the tins of goulash they had in the in the uh, ration boxes. But as it so happened, when we were sitting there, we were sitting there eating this goulash, and uh, Phil suddenly said to me, "Was it? I mean, it was bitterly cold. We was, was we had two small tents, and we 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 were outside all the time. We were sitting sitting there, huddled around the primer stove on the top of a moraine, shoveling shoveling this goulash into us and shivering probably and." Uh, Phil suddenly said, we've got company. I said, what do you mean we've got company? Nobody comes up here. He said, just look behind you. So I turned around. There, there was a bloody bear about uh, about 50 yards away. <laughs> I said, well, uh, that's bad news, isn't it? What are we going to do here? <laughs> I said, well, I've got a gun. So I went to the tent and got this gun. And the bear was still coming. It had got, got pretty close. And I thought, I'll, uh, I'll scare it off. So I did the shooting of shooting the ground in front of it again which was just as effective as it had been the previous time. The bear was more interested in seeing what it was that caused this puff of smoke in the, in the sand in front of it. It wasn't anything else. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, after they investigated that, it started, started to come on again, and uh, was pretty close by this time. Anyhow, I decided the only thing to do was to shoot it. Now, uh, when you're about, about 20 foot away from a bear, most people get pretty nervous, or at least I did, and my, my shooting wasn't exactly up to scratch uh, when I shot. And I was quite, I was quite clear that I had to, I had to make, make things work, because I only had four rounds of ammunition. I'd used one to try and frighten it away. Mm. The next one would be, would be the third. I'd only have two, two bullets left if it ran at me, so I'd have to, have to be careful. Anyhow, I fired, and it... Uh, I tried to hit it in the in the rib cage in the heart, but it uh, it hit its front leg and broke its front leg. And they always say about bears, they say there's only only one thing in in the Arctic that's more dangerous than a bear. It's a wounded bear. <laughs> Anyhow, this bear was crippled, and it went. We were camped by the side of a glacier, and it uh, it hobbled off, leaving a trail of blood behind it, and tra- trailing this leg which I'd broken, the front leg which I'd broken with a bullet, went up onto the glacier and it lay down there on the ice and lay perfectly still. It stayed still there over a long time. Ten, fifteen minutes we watched it. I said to Phil, do you think it's dead? He said, no, I don't think it's dead. I said, why doesn't it move? I said, perhaps I'll go up there and uh, give it give it a finishing shot. And he said, no, I wouldn't do that if I were you. And uh, he said, why don't you call up the helicopter? So we uh, got on the radio to them, got hold of trolls, and uh, trolls were, of course, mightily perturbed. Trolls always gets very worried about everything. And uh, they uh, dispatched a helicopter up to us. That's an hour's flying time from where the base was up to where we were, so mm. we were hung, hanging around for about an hour, and the bear lay perfectly still on the ice. But suddenly it still put its head up and started looking around. And what the hell, it's coming to life again. <laughs> and it turned out it must have heard the helicopter before we did, because as soon as the helicopter came into view, it leapt to its feet and, and ran up the glacier, and it seemed to be quite uh, quite lively. So it was probably good that Phil had told me not to go up close to it and shoot it. Anyhow, uh, pilot, Lungmark. At that time, Greenland Air's chief pilot. He took his rifle and finished it off, and then we took it back, and then we took it back to Surdale, and, and he said... 
he said, uh, he said, well, it's only a baby. You could, how could you shoot something like that? It's only a baby. I said, it didn't look like a baby when it was coming at me. And he said, but we, we could put that into the cabin. Uh, let's lift it up into the cabin. Well, there were four of us. We got hold of a leg and tried to lift it into the helicopter cabin, but we could scarcely move it off the ground. And in the end, we had to roll it into a net sling and sling it down. And then trolls got to work... Uh, Making, making a big bear stew out of it. We, of course, had to report it. As I made this report, the rules are that you can only shoot a bear in self-defence and you have to you have to justify it to the police and you're not allowed to keep the carcass or the skin. It has, they have to be, has to be delivered to the nearest police station. Well, it so happens our nearest police station was 400 kilometres distant over uh, trackless land. And so we managed to persuade the police in Nuke it wasn't wasn't really very practical to deliver the deliver the carcass and the skin to a police station. So we got permission to dispose of it however we wanted. Though they did they did want the skin, and the skin went to, eventually it went to Iceland, then went to Great Greenland in Kakatok. So uh, the uh, Lungmark there he told us told me I met him on the plane to Iceland a year, a year later the following year, and he said he'd seen my skin in Great Greenland and uh, he would buy it for me if I wanted. Well, I said, I didn't think I wanted it. I uh, did it with a bear skin. He put it on the floor and trip over it. Well, I've still got the skull on the stairs there, but also we, uh, I brought some of it home. To me? Yeah, but they're paranoid in Iceland about, about agricultural products. They're nearly as bad as the Australians. They don't actually spray you when you land there, but they paranoid about it and said they don't allow meat or anything like that in. Just like if the Icelandic ponies, for example, they once exported from Iceland, you can never bring them back again. But, uh, when we landed, I had, I had this big hunk of bear meat in a plastic bag in the, in the, in the cockpit of the plane and we landed in Akureyri about, uh, about midnight or one o'clock in the morning and there's a, 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 young, a young customs girl there to check on us. And we decided the uh, the thing to do was uh, the pi- the pilot and uh, the co-pilot would would engage her in talk while I snuck round the other side of the plane and removed a bag of bear meat after that, <laughs> <laughs> which I did. Then we smuggled it onto the plane to uh, come back to Copenhagen, so and we thought we were probably the only people in Denmark who were eating eating bear meat. I'm Julie Hollis, and you've been listening to Polar Podcasts. In the next episode, we hear more from Professor Alan Nutman about the beginnings of a model for how the ancient rocks in the Nuke region were formed. 